Welcome to the Express Soul Health and Wellness Podcast. In each episode, you'll learn from experts about the best practices and technologies to live a happier, healthier, and hopefully a longer life. Here is your host, Claudia Erdinola. Did you know that the cause of depression may be because of unhealthy gut and imbalances of the microbiome? Mental health problems in America are common and every day more people are reporting to having mental health issues. Today we're going to discuss this and why is the direct implication between our gut and mental health with Dr. Mike Grutodoria. Dr. Grutodoria holds a board certification in chiropractic neurology through the American Chiropractic Neurology Board and is on the advisory board of Functional Medicine University. Dr. Grutodoria has blended his background in nutrition, neurology, and sports medicines with years of advanced postdoctorate training in functional medicine and lifestyle management. So here with us, Dr. Mike Grutodoria. If you like the content of our podcast, subscribe to our channel and hit the notification button. Help us to spread the word on health and wellness. Also, check out our sponsors as we have great discounts for our listeners. And follow us in our social media outlets. We really appreciate your support. Thank you. Dr. Grotodaria, welcome to Express All Health and Wellness Podcast. How are you today? I am very well, Glory. Thank you so much. Thanks for being here with us. We're going to have an interesting conversation, a lot of questions about the subject of your expertise. But my first question to you is, uh, from your background, professional background, how did you happen to marry the neurology and this all of this world of neurology with your uh, chiropractor practice? It's a great question. You know, when I was when I was first out of school, I was I was an athlete. I was competing in bodybuilding, and I was just interested in working with athletes. So my my main focus really was sports injuries and things like that. And so I had a big practice just focused on that. And I just became really intrigued with the idea of how the body really works. And uh, there was a, an amazing program called the Carrick Institute uh, for Graduate Studies that had a functional neurology program. And I enrolled in that and it literally changed my life because I get a whole different appreciation for how the brain basically is trying to adapt to the environment all the time and how it runs our body. So being able to integrate, you know, functional neurology into, you know, the structure in chiropractic care and then integrating nutrition and lifestyle management and all these different things, it really came up with a program to help people take their, their life and their body from where they are to where they want to be. This is very interesting. And, and uh, again, we don't find that may often um, a professional in the healthcare industry with your background because more and more that we're seeing so many challenges on the humans, we are dealing with a lot of stressors out there and the mental health of the population, especially in the U.S., is, is just, in my opinion, and I see the stats, is just increasingly growing and seems like our traditional approach to medicine on those um, mental health diseases is just not getting the solutions that the people are looking for. Mental health is a is a such a huge part of of what I do on a regular basis. I'm um, I'm the founder of something called the Functional Medicine Alliance for an international not for profit on mental health called Same Here Global. And what I did was pull together a team of doctors like me who do functional care and married that with the psychologists and psychiatrists that are already existing in same here under the uh, leadership of Dr. Pleener. And um, what we've been able to do is really look at what is anxiety and depression? Because traditionally in our country anyway, we look at anxiety and depression as mental disorders. But what is actually going on? And why do we look at the brain two different ways? Why does a neurologist look at the brain one way when he examines somebody for migraine headaches and a psychiatrist looks at the brain entirely differently when they evaluate somebody for anxiety. It's one brain, and the brain and the mind are one. So is anxiety and depression a disease, or is it really a state of being that's created by stressors 
plus an underlying physiological imbalance in the neurology. So that's the way we look at it is what's actually going on in this person's body and chemistry and how is their lifestyle impacting that and how has their emotional stressors or previously held beliefs or traumas from the past changed the way they think. So when you have this whole combination of things, you end up what, what, with what we call anxiety or depression. So anxiety and depression, if, if, we, if I understand that better, is basically a manifestation of something that is underlying. And yet, every time a regular person visits a doctor for, for depression, especially, they go and the first thing they do is provide them with a pill and just have them under those medications. No surprise at all that after many of those individuals taking a huge amount of these uh, very well-known medications, they don't get better, which means that wasn't the answer. Well, Claudia, not one person in the entire planet has a Zoloft deficiency. So, you know, giving somebody medication to, you know, and listen, these are well-meaning doctors, but we're all a product of our training. So if your training is evaluate the person, give them a diagnosis or a label, and then look in your cookbook of what drug should we start them on? It's always the end result is what drug can we start them on? There's no testing done. There's no real significant evaluation of lifestyle. They refer them for therapy, which is amazing. You know, uh, emotional support is very critical, but there's no evaluation for epigenetics looking at how does this person's biochemistry and genetics influence the way they produce neurotransmitters, for instance. You know, do they have something called an MTHFR or COMT or MAO gene mutation or SNP? And if so, how does that influence how they think and feel? And maybe we shouldn't really be so quickly jumping on these medications as a first-line therapy. And, and I'm, I'm not anti-medication in the least bit, but it shouldn't be the first thing we do, especially without any further ex you know, examination of what's actually going on in the, in the brain. This preventive approach, let's say, so important right now in my podcast, this is my main mission. Just tell people out there, is somebody driving the car listening at us right now? Somebody in a different country listening at this uh, podcast in another time of the day and thinking, oh my God, I have my, my son, my wife, my husband, my neighbor, my friend, my cousin, whoever going into down this path of depression and and and, and, and stress and they having these medications not getting help i should tell them they have to go through a different approach so this is what we're doing here just bringing this awareness and again yes the the medication is the first answer for every single thing including i mean i had a doctor last two weeks. Uh, she's a dentist and she was telling me my daughter was presenting a lot of behavioral problems at school. And they call me, and they ask me, well, you should come to the, to the school because we're going to start medicating your kid. She started like, wait a second. I said, what happened? And then what happened was that the kid had um, a sleep apnea. So no wonder why she was cranky, not paying attention, fell asleep in a, in a school. And they were getting her a recipe of medicines of a six-year-old kid that doesn't need them. And, you know, so again, for those out there listening, if they have somebody with presenting these kind of disorders, what is the first thing they should do? Well, I mean, the first thing they should do is obviously seek help and, and get counseling. Counseling is always a must. You know, working with a good therapist is critical because whether it starts as an emotional problem that creates the anxiety and depression, or it starts as a physiological problem that creates the anxiety and depression, there's always both going on. But the reality is that we need to be looking at and, and evaluating from both sides in order to heal. See, there's a huge difference and a distinction between treating and healing. We, you know, treating, treating is really trying to get rid of the symptomatology that the, that the patient presents with. Healing is coming up with a way to give the person what they're missing and take away what's hurting them and allow the body to get back to normal. Healing only happens from the inside out. And they need support. They need to know that they're okay. They need to know that they're safe. But they also need to know that there's hope. So I'll give you an example. I had a 15-year-old high school athlete come to see me, uh, referred by a psychologist. And this boy has, is, is a terrific athlete. 
but literally has been having suicidal ideation since he's 10 years old, has been hospitalized multiple times for depression, has been on multiple rounds of medication. And by the time I saw him, I said, I said to him, do you feel that you're going to get better? And he looked me in the eye and he said, I don't think so. I, I can't remember ever feeling good. So, so hope is a really critical piece. So we evaluate this young guy and find he has a problem in every aspect of his physiology, which was really interesting because I said, you, you look like the picture of health. And he's always gotten a clean bill of health because he goes for his regular yearly, you know, physical and, you know, he passes with flying colors. But I said, nobody's looking at the function. So we did an advanced stool profile and we looked at his gut and we know that the gut plays a huge role, something called the microbiome, which is in like the back, the balance of microbes and bacteria and so on in the gastrointestinal system directly influences brain function. So total imbalance in the gut, food sensitivities, highly, highly sensitive to certain foods like dairy and, and eggs. Um, also had something called an MTHFR gene mutation, which changes the way our body handles something called folate, which is vitamin B9, which is instrumental in creating uh, serotonin and dopamine. Very, very low levels of amino acids in the body. Very low protein intake, living on carbohydrates, very common in young people. And what's very interesting is chronic inflammation. There's a test called CRP or high sensitivity CRP. That's a measure of inflammation. And a study just came out that correlates elevated CRP levels and suicidality. So you have, if you have depression and an elevated CRP, your rate of suicide or suicidal ideology or attempts are significantly higher. But nobody's even screening for chronic inflammation when we look at uh, a depressed patient. It's crazy is because chronic now, inflammation the cause? There is a subset of people with depression, a significant subset, that chronic inflammation is the cause. If you Google depression and inflammation, you get millions and millions of hits showing the correlation. And there are multiple articles linking chronic inflammation with changes in the way the brain works. We know that inflammation changes the way our brain uses amino acids and actually shunts amino acids like tryptophan away from creating serotonin and down a different pathway. So there are so many nuances to how inflammation changes the brain. Chronic inflammation in the body causes neuroinflammation and eventually neurodegeneration. So we know all of these things are totally linked. It is like a circle in between what is happening in, in our mental health and the connection with the gut. And this is something that I would like to learn more from you because I want to bring this out awareness. Everything that happens in our systems as a whole comes and is affected from the health of the gut and the microbiome. People don't believe that. They think, again, this reductionist way of looking at the humans as separate entities. It is my brain, but it's separate from my gut. My heart is separate from my, heart, my, my gut. My skin is just outside of me. It doesn't have anything to do with the gut, which we know, we know is totally not true. Everything comes from inside out. So how we can bring that awareness on people? Tell us more about that connection between the gut and the brain. It used to be thought that all bacteria was bad and antibiotics were the salvation of, of, of humankind. Um, I actually had breakfast with a, an internal medicine doctor and he said, oh my God, antibiotics and uh, cholesterol lowering medication are the two greatest gifts to man. And I thought, oh my goodness, it's so funny how we could see things so differently. Um, listen, antibiotics can be life-saving medications, but they were used so rampantly, especially in young kids, that um, we, didn't, we didn't realize that there was something called a microbiome until 2008. So we were indiscriminately using antibiotics every time somebody had an infection. And even if somebody had a viral infection, commonly they would get an antibiotic just in case there was a bacterial infection. Or even mothers de delivering a child they're, they're routinely given antibiotics prophylactically. Meanwhile, we, that's when the bio, microbiome is, is actually starting to grow in the child. 
So all of these different things that we didn't realize for forever until 2008 and 2010 and whatever, when we finished this human microbiome project, was that we have literally trillions and trillions of bacteria that live inside of our gastrointestinal system, as well as in and on our body and other body, body cavities, but predominantly in the gut. This microbiome comprises 10 times the number of cells than we have human cells. So we're actually one-tenth human and nine-tenths bacteria. Oh my but God, that's beautiful. We have trillions of cells that have tons and tons of DNA. We have 28,000 genes in our body, but we have tens of thousands of genes in these uh, microbes that have this symbiotic relationship with us because they're able to do things that we're not and we work together. We give them a place to live and we give them food and then they do so much for us. They interface with our immune system, our gastrointestinal system, our nervous system, and cognition and mood. So we know that the health of the gut is critical to the health of the brain and the immune system. So what's really interesting is if we aren't looking at the gut when we look at any chronic illness, we're totally missing the boat because there's a direct one-on-one -on -one correlation. Six to 800 research articles a day come out on the, the relationship of the microbiome and human health. That is great that all of these researchers are coming to the light, but people are not knowing about it. And that's why these channels are so important. We need to bring this to light. We need to bring it in terms that people understand. I always tell in my podcast, I am not a doctor. I, I am a double master in engineering. I see everything from an engineering perspective. I want to understand why everything is happening, why the systems of the body work certain way or others. And some, something that you just mentioned, why from one physician to another, the understanding of one issue is a totally different thing. It's supposed to be a, a same interpretation. If I take my car that have a radiator that is broken to one mechanic, the mechanic number one say, your radiator is broken. If I take it to another one, it will say, your radiator is broken and here is what we have to do. But if I go to a doctor, one to another, they cannot tell me totally different story. And we need to understand that's why you and practitioners like you that bring this functional medicine, the holistic approach to the health to the human are so important. So let's say that your doctor graduated from medical school 22 years ago. Before, you know, to, before the microbiome project came out. And they became an expert in their field and they became so busy basically working 10 hours a day seeing patient after patient after patient. When do they have the opportunity to then go back to school and, and update all their information? If you had a mechanic that was trained 25 years ago on cars from, you know, the 1990s. And then all of a sudden they, they are presented with a car from 2023. They probably they wouldn't understand. know what to do either. You're so absolutely it's, right. We're all a product of our training and it's, and it's this intense curiosity and desire to learn that really drives the functional medicine movement because people who are doing what we're doing are really just so crazy about learning and looking at, you know, what can we do to actually improve what we, what we provide for patients and how we look at a patient that we're striving for, you know, more and more education. I mean, I can't tell you the number of courses I take and, and, you know, studying that I do all the time in order to, in order to be able to be the best doctor that I can be. And I, I, I mean, I saw your bio, which I, I mentioned it in the intro of this podcast also is going to be uh, at the description box in, in this podcast in YouTube and in all of the channels around the world that we're going to be uh, publishing this interview with you. It's very impressive, but you are absolutely right. The, our regular doctors get too busy, but it's up to us, the consumer, to find those who gave us the answer, who can look at us in an integrative way, I um, I have to say that if you go to to a family physician, and and you're gonna have uh, five minutes, seven tops, if you're lucky, to tell this person what is wrong with you, and that person is gonna tell you the whole answer by not even looking at test results, test blood tests, stools, or whatever they needed to be done for really he understand what it happens. You're lucky. I mean. Our our um, healthcare system is 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 not as currently is 
designed for, for the physicians to have the time to, to really understand what happened with that patient. Well, it's a sickness care system. It's not a health care system. Nobody, nobody is trying to establish health. What they're trying to do is get us unsick, which is a great, which is a great role, except that functional medicine is not one to one with the sickness care system. It should, everybody should be literally working together. But what happens is there's, there is so much ego that goes into being a doctor in, in many cases that, you know, when, when, you know, a doctor feels that, you know, why are you running so many tests? Why, you know, and then what, you know, they get a little irritated when they get a report from me and they say, well, look, this is what's going on physiologically. And doctors are not really trained to kind of work something all the way through. They're trained literally to create a diagnosis. And um, they're amazing at it. I mean, there's nowhere in the world you'd rather be than in America if you have if you have an acute injury, if you have a heart attack, a stroke. But you, you can't apply those same principles of acute care to chronic illness. It just doesn't work. Medication can't undo what lifestyle did. Correct. And and again, our technology in, in healthcare right now is so amazing for the acute solutions. I mean, you have you get in a car accident, you go to emergency room, they gonna do everything to get you, you know, through, of course, to heal you. This is amazing. But we're talking about here day to day chronic illness. And I was reading some stats that it really blows my mind this morning. I was listening to a podcast and I wrote it down because it was so pertinent to our conversation today. Here it is. This is Dr. Mark Hyman. He mentioned that for every 10% increase on consumption of ultra processed foods, the risk of death goes up to 14% for every 10. Then in the USA alone, the normal diet of an adult person in the USA, 60% consisted in ultra processed food. And in kids, this is where it really gets me. It's about 70% of the normal products they consume. Our children today are ultra processed food. And I want to go back to your patient, the 15 year old athlete that you discovered that he was, his diet was so bad. I want to take your take on this. It's crazy. I mean, it should be illegal. We know the statistics. We know that it hurts us and yet it's still available, you know, and what's happened is it's cheaper and quicker to eat garbage. And that's a big problem. Listen, let me ask you a question. I'm going to give you a question. How long could a freshwater fish live in the saltwater ocean? Can probably. I don't know how long, but probably will die like this. It's nothing there that is normal for him. Right. It can't adapt to that environment. It's totally, totally foreign. So in the in the seventies and eighties, there was a show in America called Little House on the Prairie. And it was about this family that lived on a farm. And it was all about their life. And essentially, for 10,000 years, human beings lived that way. They lived outside. They lived in a hut or a teepee or a log cabin or an igloo. They had fire and candles. They were outside. They worked on the farm. They ate locally grown food. They drank water that was clean. There was no toxic pesticides. They had tremendous amounts of sunlight. They didn't weren't overexposed to indoor lights all the time, and they weren't overexposed to technologies. So they didn't get an overexposure of blue light changing their circadian biology. They didn't have chronic stress every single day. So the environment was entirely different. Now, obviously, they had their own problems. They didn't have, they, they had infections and they had, you know, injuries that, you know, they didn't have the hospitalization that we have and things like that. But we are trying to adapt to an environment that's absolutely not designed for human beings. We now live inside 99% of the time. We sit or lie down 90 plus percent of the time. We eat 60% ultra processed foods, barely eat any vegetables. When we do, it's laden with chemicals. We drink gallons and gallons and gallons of soda every year on, you know, per person. The amount of sugar consumed in America is insane. We don't do anything to maintain our microbiome. And, and yet we want to be healthy and we wonder why we're not. It's where the, where the freshwater fish trying to live in the ocean. It, it is an irony, but also, um, as I say, this, this modern life make everything very convenient. We're not hunting anymore. We're not eating our animals anymore. We're not outside uh, receiving sunlight anymore. 
And now I, I guess this is kind of like the awakening of post COVID when people say, wait a second, I found so many voices telling me something different about this virus or whatever it is. And what can I do myself to prevent that from happening to me? But if it happens that I catch the virus, I just navigated like any other day will be fine. I'll get through. What can I do? And then this awakening of, okay, hey, we need more sunlight. We need to get outside. We need to eat healthier foods. We need to consume more uh, proper human diet food, more proteins, more natural foods, not processed foods. I think this is an awakening right now on the population of the U.S. if they want to live healthier and live longer. Well, I mean, that's really the key. So what's interesting is that in order to get healthy, it takes, a, it, it takes changing your priorities. You can't fit what I do into your existing lifestyle because right now when somebody gets sick, the responsibility of them getting well in the patient's mind is the doctor's. The doctor's going to take care of me. So there's no personal responsibility. All I have to do is swallow the pill that they gave me. Whereas when they come to me, they realize, wow, this is an entirely different way of looking at it. We're going to talk about what's going on in your life. We're going to talk about how you live your life, how you sleep, how often you move your bowels, what kind of stress you're under, how happy are you on a scale from one to 10? I mean, people have cried when I asked them that question because they said, nobody's ever asked me that before. So, I mean, if, if the, what is the goal? What's this all about? Anyway, what's life about? If, if it's not about health and happiness, what else is there? So you can't be happy if you're not healthy. And I, I can tell you plenty of people that would give all that they've ever had and ever made just for one more year of good health. But what it comes down to is it's an investment. It's an investment of time, energy, and money. And when you make that investment, everything else in your life changes because you make yourself a priority. When you upgrade your thinking, you upgrade everything. I absolutely agree with you. And again, you mentioned about the cost of eating healthy. And I'm telling you, the ultra processed foods, they're not cheap. And actually, some if, if people really get into thinking and, as you say, making a priority, what what is their their health? Because again, I get it's a disconnection between people that understand that they're not happy. Oh, I'm not happy. I'm stressed. I'm depressed. But that has nothing to do with my health. Otherwise, I'm perfect. Oh yeah, I need the chips and drink the cokes and get into the couch and and get more consuming these uh, carbs that are full of sugars. So back to this patient that you mentioned us. Uh, the 15-year-old depressed kid that they bring to your practice, what was like the main discovery that you make in his biology that was creating this depression on this young man? So depression very often and, and anxiety is really a perfect storm of things that are going on. And then this, this, this experience develops, right? So there's usually an emotional stressor that will stimulate this process. But when you have this underlying physiology, like you and I can experience the same exact stress. Two people can, two soldiers can go to Afghanistan, for instance, and go into war. And one comes back with PTSD and the other one doesn't. What's the difference between these two people that experience the same stressors? Stress is different in all of us because it depends on how our body adapts to the stress. How much stress changes our nervous system is really critically important to understand. We know we have a fight or flight mechanism, which is called the sympathetic nervous system. And we have the parasympathetic nervous system, which is, um, which is called rest and digest, right? And the parasympathetic nervous system is supposed to be functioning all the time. And should stress arise, then this one pops up and then goes right back down. Most people are living like this. Tremendous amounts of stress. And as a result, the nervous system is functioning very differently. So now you're much more susceptible to changes in cognition, thinking, and feeling because the nervous system is in imbalance state. So now we look at what underlying physiological functions do you have? What do your hormones look like? What does your microbiome look like? Do you have a chronic inflammatory condition? 
Are you sleeping? Do you exercise? How much sunlight do you get? Do you have, you know, all of these different things all go into it. So when we look at, we cast a wide net and we see all these things, then we work together over a three month period and remediate each one of the problems that we found. And literally you come out the other end, a different person because you learned, you got an education as to how your body works, but also we fixed each thing that we found. So now you're empowered to take care of yourself versus, I mean, we didn't get an owner's manual when we were born. So we have no idea how our body works. We just assume that it works well until it doesn't. And that's a big part of the problem because we're not taught how it works until it fails. But then even then, we're either trying to figure it out on our own with, uh, with Google or our doctor is basically just giving us medication to stamp out those symptoms. It's really critical that people t- understand that getting healthy is, is their own personal responsibility. Absolutely. If somebody asks me, who is your healthcare provider? I say, me, me. Nobody will care more about what I eat, what I drink, how I rest at night, how I take care of my, of my environment around me, food, family, relationships, uh, how I feed my brain, what kind of information I get through to myself. I cannot relay. I cannot give up the power of taking care of myself on a five minutes visit to a doctor. It, it's just not going to happen. Well, it's just been our paradigm for generations. So that's what we're used to. We're used to going to the doctor, getting medication to treat the symptoms that we currently have, and then waiting until the next time we have to go see the doctor or until something else pops up. That's true. So we were talking about the microbiome and basically that, that colony of so many bugs and bacteria that live with us inside and outside, because I believe we also have it in our skin, in, in not our tissues, how we can take care of that. I mean, how we can take our audience right now and almost kick the camera, <laughs> how we can tell them to take care of the microbiome. What would be like best practices for us to have a healthier microbiome? You know, one of the things that people say, you know, commonly is, I don't have any gut issues. I don't really think I need to do a stool test. Well, only 50% of people that have gut issues have gut symptoms. So there's a, there's a really big uh, separation between the imbalance in the gut and how people feel. So you might not have gut symptoms, but you might have chronic migraines. So there's a neurological, all these, you know, far reaching things. You can have a, a gut issue and have autoimmunity because we know that the vast majority of autoimmunity begins in the gastrointestinal system. So when we look at all of these different things, we can say, well, if somebody is relatively healthy and they don't have chronic illness, like let's say we're starting out with young people, you know, the goal is to not eat processed foods because processed foods and sugars are detrimental to the gut. We know that glyphosate is terrible for the gut, which is, you know, Roundup that we're all exposed to and all toxic with. I mean, it's, it's almost, it's ubiquitous. There's no way around that, unfortunately. But we know that certain types of foods are definitely, you know, will create a, an unhealthy environment. Hormone changes, chronic stress, all those things alter the microbiome. Um, but we know that sunshine plays a gigantic role in overall gut microbiome health. So it's, it's really interesting. How, how is that? The sunshine and the yeah. microbiome. Oh, my. Yeah, it's in. Into- oh, my God. We could Please go down a rabbit us hole. About it. I, I live in Florida. Sunshine is very important for me and for us. And, and no wonder why during COVID people really thought that it was a good thing to be outside. Well, it's, it's been demonized. The sun has been demonized in our culture, you know, like avoid the sun. It causes cancer. Meanwhile, you know, since sunscreen has become so unbelievably, um, you know, promoted and, and encouraged by everybody, the, the melanoma rates have, have gone up. For, you know, for skin cancer. So it, you know, it's, it's a really strange, you know, situation. Like, how can you explain that? How, why does skin cancer rates go up when we use sunscreen? Uh, we know that sun avoidance is just as bad as smoking as far as overall health. So we, we've been again, you know, brainwashed into thinking that something's bad for us. Now, of course, overexposure to the sun and getting our, you know, getting burned is no good. 
And, you know, people will develop skin cancers if they have overexposure. But we know that we are literally a giant solar panel. We are absorbing sunlight all the time. If we think about the, the something called the electromagnetic spectrum, which is all of the rays that come out of the sun, what we see is this very tiny sliver of that, which is what we're able to see with our eyes, which is called visible light spectrum. And that would be the colors of the rainbow. So white light breaks up into the rainbow, red, orange, yellow, green, blue, indigo, violet. Those colors are what stimulate our eye and our retina. We can't see ultraviolet light. We can't see infrared, you know, we can't see all these other, yeah, um, we can't see in, uh, like we can't see an x-ray, for instance. So all of these different frequencies all impact us. But when we live inside and away from the sun, we're getting just that visible light and predominantly blue frequencies. So from blue artificial is devices. Artificial devices, overstimulating to the brain. And it changes our circadian biology. The brain has two pacemakers. One is movement. Every time we move, we stimulate the brain. The other one is light because light stimulates these things called melanopsin receptors in our retina that cause changes in the way our biological clock work. Basically, it's like the stimulus for an area in the brain that causes our biological clock to function. It's called a suprachiasmatic nucleus. Then every cell in our body has clock genes that are related to that main clock in the brain. So everything is connected to light, including hormone changes. So, and we know that actually bacteria will fluoresce based on exposure to the sun. So all of these, like we were designed to live outside, like that, that show I was telling you about. So when we change our environment, we change everything. And it's really, really important to understand that every one of us should have a gastrointestinal assessment and you look at the microbiome. But, the, you know, probably 40 or 50% of Americans have some kind of functional gastrointestinal disorder, whether it be IBS, reflux, a diarrhea, constipation. I mean, I ask people, and you know, on a regular basis, how often do you move your bowels? And they're like, oh, well, once a week. I'm like, shocked, once a week? How long has it been like that? Oh, that's just the way I am. I've always been like that. So people just assume that that's normal. You know, or, you know, people with IBS, I mean, their, their whole body. I mean, I have uh, somebody who has chronic IBS and they had so much nutritional deficiency. They had no iron, no B12, no anything because the, the transit time in, in her body was so tremendous that she wasn't able to absorb nutrients. And as a result, she had chronic fatigue syndrome that they were given a medication for. You know, you made me think about something now that you mentioned the reflux because um, family member of mine <laughs> like to take a lot of antibiotics for everything. And it's funny because in, it's, it was some, some little flu. They have antibiotics. Two days after, terrible reflux. What was that person say to me? I think what I ate, it was a little heavy. I had reflux. I was thinking maybe it's because you basically wash out with your antibiotics every single good bug that you have in your gastrointestinal tract and now yeah no wonder why you have the reflux so i think when people start thinking first not normalizing the the symptoms or whatever they experience that is normal because it's not normal in second taking more responsibility of what they eat and and really control this intake of um, antibiotics right and left i think is not good yeah and and i think that the awareness is starting to build but the number of people that take antacids, I mean, I think antacids are, are maybe, you know, in the top three medications used on a daily basis and, and they're the prescriptions, but all the over the counter. I mean, people take, people take Tums because their doctor says they're good because they have calcium. But meanwhile, when you lower stomach acid, you stop, you stop absorbing calcium. So it's just, it, it, you can't even imagine that the ridiculousness that's going on in healthcare because to take Tums for a calcium supplement is literally like insane. So what we need to do, and when we realize that everything works from north to south in the gut, your stomach acid needs to be very intense in order to digest your, your proteins, but it also sterilizes your food. If bugs are going to get into us, they're going to come in through our mouth. Because the skin is a barrier, the lungs are a barrier, the mouth is where they're coming in. But generally, they fall into the stomach where we have hydrochloric acid, which is a pH of one, and it basically kills everything that comes in. 
But when we're taking Tums and antacids all the time, it raises the stomach pH to four or five. And now all of a sudden those bugs can survive that and get right into our gastrointestinal system. So then the GI tract, the stomach acid, stimulates the pancreas to release antacids to be able to neutralize the bolus of food that goes into the small intestine, but also to stimulate its release of more enzymes. So when we have low stomach acid, we have less enzymes that are released, so we fully don't digest our food. And now you have an increase in bacterial growth on the undigested food. It also changes the way our nervous system works in the gut, especially when we're eating constantly and we don't take a break between, between meals because we're always snacking. There's something called the migrating motor complex in the, in the gut that transits all of this bacteria when we're fasting in between meals. It's cleaning out the gut. But because we're always eating, I mean, people go to work and there's, there's food in the kitchen. You know, oh, I brought in a cake from uh, last night. And people are constantly just sticking food in their mouth. They're just messing, well, messing up the way that the entire system works. And we weren't designed to eat so much. That was uh, actually one of those paradigms that, that we just break at home. We, and I always practice my, my intermittent fasting from time, times to times during my entire life. My husband never. And we went to a vacation in Europe and he, you know, we overconsumed the, the, the carbs there. Came back with a little more pounds. He more than he wanted. And I say, okay, if you want to do this, so we, we need to break from this pattern. We're not on vacation anymore. And I want you to get into this program. So no carbs. And now we're going to restrict the timing of eating. He was like, what? So I'm not going to have breakfast as soon as I wake up, lunch at midday, dinner. What about my fruit? What about my snacks? Let's start little by little. So we start eating um, basically for um, a, a 16 hours not eating, eating the rest, six, uh, then 18 hours, and now we're 24. Basically, we're eating only from 11 a.m. to 4 p.m. And it's easier for us because we work both from home. I know it's not as easy for somebody that goes to an office, as you mentioned, where they bring the cakes, the donuts, when they are constantly picking. But even in those situations, you're still in control. You still can control what you eat at, at what times. I'm telling you the changes on that and that uh, only on the window of time of eating. It is, it just has been a blessing. My husband is going to be 75 best shape I, he has ever been as strong as never before. Um, and he lost all of those extra pounds. He's wonderful. He's back to his, the weight that he was when, when he was, uh, you know, serving in Southeast Asia for the air force. It was excellent, excellent shape. So, I would say that in any circumstances, people working from an office, from home, traveling, in every single case, you're in control. It's just being in that discipline and understanding how much you affect your overall systems. When you eat the wrong foods, 11 million people die every year in the world for eating the wrong foods. This is insane. This is a formula for disaster. I just get we need to get more discipline in the way we consume our, our fruits. Self, self-discipline is a superpower, you know? Absolutely. When, when, Absolutely. And, 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 and it can and must be developed. I mean, we need to teach people how to create self-discipline. And, you know, we, we have an abnormal relationship with food. That's the big problem is that, you know, people eat when they're happy, when they're sad, when they're, you know, when they're socializing, when they're bored, you know, when they're depressed. All the time, it calls for eating. And, you know, and the, and the challenge is that, you know, you work a long day, you're tired, you go home, you eat, and then you sit on the couch and watch TV and mindlessly eat more. You know, and all of these things cause changes, especially this timed feeding. Timed feeding has a huge impact on circadian biology, and that changes hormone levels. We know that, we know that eating at night and, and uh, over, too much light at night creates obesity. Circadian rhythms. I'm glad you touched the, the subject because you mentioned it before. Our brain has these two amazing mechanisms, the parasympathetic and the sympathetic. So by people being all the time in a hurry and this hyper uh, stimulation of the, of the body by eating, these sugars create this stimulation, not sleeping enough because when it's time, when the sun goes down, 
and, and, and it's time for let your body rest. People are not resting, dog. They are attached to the electronics. The kids get a screen time of hours and hours during the day. And at night is when they chat with the girlfriend, the boyfriend, the friends, and they and, and the mother just show up. Uh, did you turn off your phone? Yes, ma'am. Maybe not. They are there. So all of those sleeping patterns are disrupted. How not sleeping well can affect us. Oh, I mean, it's it's tremendous. You know, it can't be it can't be understated how. But you know, the the challenge is that people are not sleeping well because of all these problems, and they don't many times don't even realize it. So they're they're fatigued all the time because their sleep is not is not appropriate. You know, they're not in. Uh, you know, their their brain. So we have this this circadian rhythm with it. You know, with on day night cycles and how it it deals with our cortisol waking response. So cortisol is the hormone that wakes us up very high in the morning, gets us going, stimulates our system. And then slowly throughout the day, cortisol decreases. And then at a certain point in late afternoon, melatonin starts to rise. And then it hits a certain height where it actually puts us to sleep. But if our light environment's abnormal and, you know, indoor lighting is, is just as stimulating, your, your brain doesn't know the difference between indoor lighting at night and the, and, and the daytime. So your brain still thinks it's day at 12 o'clock when you're on your phone. And then you just decide, all right, I'm going to turn my phone off and go to sleep. Well, it takes a while for your brain to actually readjust to change that melatonin cortisol cycle. So people have broken sleep because they're hormonally abs- you know, out of balance. So that's why we wear these blue blocking glasses. You know, I, I encourage at everybody night. to wear. Yeah, I mean, even like, uh, you know, I mean, you know, on these, you know, screens. You know, if, if somebody had a job and they worked all day on a computer, they should be wearing blue blocking glasses. It's just as easy as that. Um, at night, anytime after dark, if you're on your computer or on a phone, you should be wearing blue blocking glasses. I wear and these things every night. you can find them night. very cheap in Amazon. They're yeah, like 50 you could get, bucks. Right. You can get inexpensive ones. You can get, you know, fancy ones, whatever. But when you block the blue light at night, it literally changes everything. So it's a very, very powerful modality. So I think it's definitely, you know, something... Some, you know, everybody should look into. Perfect. Doctor, when a new patient comes to your practice suffering from anxiety, depression, maybe Alzheimer's or, or, or Parkinson's or all of these uh, neurological degenerative uh, diseases, are those diseases, especially the ones that come from degeneration of, of the neurons, can be uh, reversed? by uh, taking an approach from, from the gut and, and the, the health of the gut? So, you know, there's a, a new paper came out. There was, uh, there's a, a Dr. Dale Bredesen who wrote extensively on Alzheimer's disease. And um, there's a, a, another amazing doctor, one of my colleagues, Kat Toops, T-O-U-P-S, who is an integrative psychiatrist in California. And they just published a paper um, on precision medicine and Alzheimer's disease essentially discussing all the things that we're talking about here and seeing amazing results, especially in early onset um, and, and, you know, in early cognitive decline. The challenge is that once somebody has Alzheimer's disease symptoms, they've had Alzheimer's disease for 10 years already. So, wow. Yeah. So, you know, it's the destruction of, of the brain pathways as a result of this you know, chronic buildup of, of abnormal proteins in the brain and misfolding of proteins and so on that happens is really secondary to many different factors. There's, there's something called an APO, APOE4 gene that predisposes us to increased risk of Alzheimer's. But we know that chronic elevated blood sugar is, is definitely a predisposing factor. Chronic aluminum toxicity, chronic inflammation in the body, chronic uh, blood sugar dysregulation that's causing highs and lows throughout the day. Um, iron deficiency, all of these things predispose us to neuronal degeneration. And the gut brain connection is just as powerful as ever when it comes to neurodegeneration. We know that there's a direct link between Parkinsonism and gut dysbiosis. So chronic inflammation in the gut can actually transcend the vagus nerve right into the brainstem and change the way our body makes dopamine and cause eventual dopaminergic changes in the brainstem and Parkinsonism. So yes, it's everything is connected to everything. And that's why we have to, from a functional perspective, we take a very wide view and we get to know the patient to say, 
hey, tell me about who you are. Like somebody comes in initially and I say, um, tell me about yourself. And they're like, well, my head is bothering me. I said, no, I don't want to hear about your problems. I want to hear about you. Who are you? What do you do? No what doctor do like? asked me that ever. Right. But, but in order to get well, you need to develop a relationship because I need to know more about who you are and what your motivations are because then I can help you to leverage what you want. I ask people three basic questions. What, and, and this is their homework usually first day. What do you really, 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 really want? Why do you want it? And why don't you have it already? And it's mind boggling because most people don't think about themselves from that point of view. So, you know, when we start thinking about the stresses that we experience, a lot of it is because of our life dissatisfaction. You know, I'm not happy with where I'm at. I'm not happy with my job. I'm not happy with the shape that I'm in. I'm not happy that I can't lose weight. I'm not happy that I can't find a spouse. Everything comes down to, you know, the, the level of satisfaction we have with our lives. So if, if us as healthcare providers can help people to see that we can change our, our perspective, we can create happiness through health. If I can help somebody to get into great shape, they feel empowered to change everything else. So really changing people's lives is what we're all about. It's not Beautiful. just, fi- it's not just fixing underlying physiological imbalances. And it certainly doesn't come in a pill bottle or a supplement bottle. Absolutely. And again, uh, no doctor asked me questions as you ask your, your patients ever before. So for those that are listening right now and they would like to know about your practice, tell us a little bit about your practice. Where are you located? If they are out of the state where you practice, can they still can get in yeah, touch with you definitely. for a consultation? So the office is in Huntington, New York, which is on Long Island. Uh, they can find me through the website, which is the optimum you, the letter U dot com. And they can also check out samehereglobal.org, which is the organization that I'm involved with. Um, and they can look on the doctor's alliance. There's something called alliances, one of the drop downs. And there's something called the doctor's alliance. And that's where all the functional practitioners, um, are the ones that dovetail with the psych alliance. There's two right next to each other. All the, um, the most amazing psychologists and psychiatrists in the country. And then this group of amazing functional, functional medicine, functional neuro practitioners, uh, in the doctor's alliance. And so people with mental health challenges can really check out so many good resources, you know, through same here global. And, um, yeah. And, you know, I love doing these podcasts because it's so important for us to share information because people are searching and, and there's so much misinformation. You know, it's, uh, it's crazy because somebody loses weight, you know, because like they, Whatever they go on a, you know, they eat grapefruit for six months and then all of a sudden they're a health coach. They call themselves a health coach and now they're telling everybody how to live. So, you know, that you have to be careful with who you're listening to. Absolutely. And again, I'm telling everybody I'm not a doctor. I am not a health coach. I'm just somebody like you. No, and you're I'm spreading finding information, experts, which is amazing. Bringing the experts. And I ask the questions and you guys tell us from your perspective all of those, the answers to those questions that we got. So also for those that are listening right now, all the information about Dr. Mike is going to be posted in the description box in our podcast and in all of the channels that we are uh, syndicated around the world, also in my website. So if you want to know more about him, his practice, his services, all of the information is going to be there in in your episode and i really really appreciate your time and your and your wisdom in in letting us know all of this amazing world of the microbiome of the nutrition how your gut is connected to the you know mental health um problems that most of the population in the u.s may be going through and and for those that don't how to prevent it from happening yeah, well, I really appreciate you having me here. And it's so important for us to keep sharing this type of information because so many people are suffering needlessly and, and there are solutions to their problems and, and they need to know that there's hope because, you know, when people become hopeless, uh, you know, it, it really kind of changes the entire trajectory of their life. So again, thank you so much, Claudia, for having me today. Thank you, Dr. Mike. If you like the content of my podcast, please subscribe right here. Don't forget to hit the notification button so you will be notified when we are posting more episodes of my podcast and more of this content. And if you are so kind to write a review, that will help us to 
for others to find our content and spread the word on wellness. Also, check out our sponsors and the links, the affiliate links that we have below with amazing discounts that we are offering to you, our listeners. So thanks for listening. And again, don't forget to subscribe. Until next time, remember, health is wealth for the body, mind, and soul. Take care. Thank you very much for listening. And if you like the information that we shared with you today, please subscribe to the Express Soul Health and Wellness Podcast and follow us in the social media outlets of your choice. Until next time, please remember, health is wealth for the body, mind and soul.